Uh, I should probably start by um, emphasizing the, the words historical context in that title, because um, I'm not uh, a literary scholar. I'm not a specialist Shakespearean. I'm not a um, person with any kind of particular investment in the authorship issue. Uh, but I am a historian um, of Elizabethan politics and political culture. So you can see a couple of things there. Um, I suppose my uh, claim to expertise, such as it is, is that I've written rather too much about the Earl of Essex uh, over the years. Um, some years ago, I also uh, published an article in uh, Shakespeare Quarterly um, about um, it's in a, a kind of a preliminary attempt to explain the Essex <laughs> rising of the 8th of February 1601 and its connection with uh, Shakespeare's company of players and his play, Richard II. By the way, you might notice I use the word rising rather than rebellion. I think you might see why I do that as we, we go through this. So um, I'm going to sort of give the, 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 the sort of... Um, cooks to a version of the kind of the background to all of this. So I want to begin this morning with a book that may be familiar to some of you, perhaps many of you, uh, a conference about the next succession to the Crown of England. Uh, this book was first teased at the end of a publication by the English Jesuit leader Robert Parsons uh, in 1593. The book's dedication is dated the, this last day of December 1593, but it's not printed until 1594, and copies didn't finally begin arriving in uh, England until late 1595. Um, as you can perhaps see here, um, it was printed with a fake imprint, published with a fake imprint, and its authorship was disguised behind the pseudonym of R. Dolman. Now, all of those, I think, are pointers to the politically explosive uh, nature of this book. And for the sake of uh, brevity, I'm just going to call it the Dolman book. Despite being immediately banned, uh, the Dolman book comprehensively shattered Elizabeth's prohibition on any public discussion of the royal succession, explicitly naming names and evaluating the dynastic credentials, credentials of many of the, the uh, potential claimants to be her successor. There was even a handy uh, pull-out chart at the end, which survives in some copies. Um, don't, you kind of need this because the book itself is, is very large. It goes into a lot of detail. Um, Dolman principally targeted the pretensions of James VI of Scotland and implicitly favoured the rival claim of Philip II of Spain, which was subsequently vested in his daughter, the Infanta Isabella. The detailed content of the book showed that dynastic claims harking back to the Wars of the Roses were still very much alive, uh, giving extra edge to the numerous plays and poems of the 1590s, which explore, explored those past effusions of blood. The book uh, closed um, by predicting that some kind of armed confrontation between the contenders for Elizabeth's throne was almost inevitable in the future, even if they sought to avoid full-scale civil war. And this is just, there's several quotes I could pick. That's just one I highlighted there. Um, Dolman also um, sought to stir up political tensions in the present by dedicating the book to the Earl of Essex even putting the Earl's name on the title page as if he had authorized it. This was a cunning move because Essex was already establishing himself as James's chief supporter in England. However, the phrasing of the dedication was even more telling. No man is in more high and eminent place or dignity at this day in our realm than yourself. And consequently, no man liked to have a greater part or sway in deciding of this great affair. This not only represented an attempt to drive a wedge between Essex and James, but also between Essex and Elizabeth, who initially blamed the Earl when the Dolman book appeared. By explicitly predicting that Essex would be England's future kingmaker, Dolman pinned a giant political bullseye on Essex in the eyes of rival courtiers. And Essex certainly had rivals. In July 1594, 
when uh, Elizabeth gave him a warrant for £4,000, she supposedly warned him, and this kind of is picked up in one of those quotes there, I think, look to thyself, good Essex, and be wise to help thyself without giving thy enemies advantage, and my hand shall be readier to help thee than any other. Now, I don't have time to explain um, the how the, the political rivalries at Elizabeth's court became increasingly sort of obvious and hard-edged during the 1590s. I, I've quite literally written a book about that. Um, however, the widespread belief that Essex represented the future of England was increasingly challenged by a loose coalition of courtiers who felt slighted by Essex's often arrogant behavior or who feared that the success of the Earl and his friends would imperil their own political and financial fortunes. The glue um, which really held that anti-Essex uh, coalition together was Sir Robert Cecil, who became Elizabeth's principal secretary of state in July uh, 1596. Cecil took care to main maintain the appearance of being the queen's selfless servant and allowed others to take up uh, the running against Essex. So there's only one occasion I can think of before 1601 when he actually kind of lets the mask slip about what he really feels about Essex. He, vent, he vents it in one letter, and I think he realizes that's not a good thing to do, so he doesn't do it again. So um, he, he works with a group that kind of comes together against Essex. Um, the Lord Admiral, um, who becomes the Earl of Nottingham, uh, Sir Walter Rawley, um, Lord Cobham, who was uh, Cecil's brother-in-law, um, Lord Buckhurst, who succeeded Ce Cecil's father as Lord Treasurer, and there's a, a number of other kind of lesser or less prestigious figures, including Edward Cook, the Attorney General. Now, historians have typically blamed the political conflicts of the 1590s solely on Essex and his immoderate greed for power and patronage. In fact, the Elizabethan political system had already been broken by Cecil's father, Lord Burley, whose unprecedented accumulation of officers, clients, and influence, and not to mention money, um, created a distorting effect uh, on politics across both uh, England and, and also Ireland. Burley was, was also notable for his aggressiveness in ensuring that Sir Robert Cecil would succeed him at the heart of Elizabeth's government. He was also ruthless in ratcheting up the system of surveillance and persecution of Catholics uh, in the 1590s, uh, even uh, fabricating intelligence of a new Spanish armada in order to convince Elizabeth to go ahead with the scheme. Uh, with intentionally bitter irony, Catholics called it the Sicilian Inquisition. So all of this is kind of represents Robert Cecil's political patrimony. Now, um, one of the reasons why Elizabethan politics became so polarized during Elizabeth's final years was that the Elizabethan regime was a series of interconnected family networks. To some degree, uh, the shared uh, bonds of blood, uh, marriage, and past obligation, and of the direct kind of personal loyalty to Elizabeth herself all served to dampen down political division. And some courtiers uh, tried to maintain to both friends and enemies of Essex uh, alike right to the end. However, um, when appeals to common loyalties finally lost their efficacy, the divisions between the rival groupings um, became all the sharper and were compounded by accusations of personal betrayal. So it's like a, um, a, a, an internal family feud, right? So um, they get particularly nasty when things fall apart. And I think that's, what, that's a, a kind of uh, characteristic of what we're looking at with Elizabeth's uh, court. The divisions within the Elizabethan, re Elizabethan regime uh, became increasingly evident in the months before old Lord Burley's death in August 1598 and only increased thereafter. Although they had a, 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 a poisonously personal quality, for instance, between uh, Essex and Cobham or between uh, Essex and Raleigh, 
These divisions were also um, fundamentally about policy. When Burley and Buckhurst urged Elizabeth to follow the example of Henry IV of France um, and make peace with Spain in 1598, Essex saw this as a betrayal of England's Dutch allies and as opening the way for a disarmament of England, um, which would leave it vulnerable uh, to a future Spanish invasion. Essex believed that Spain would never willingly abandon um, lost my place uh, never willingly abandon <laughs> I don't know what that is anyway, um, would never willingly abandon its plans to conquer England and to reimpose Catholicism at the point of a gun. So in his view, any peace with Spain that was not based upon Spanish military defeat must be either dangerously naive or corrupted by the financial gains which they hoped to make from that renewed contact with Spain. For their part, the critics of Essex accused him of being a warmonger and of wanting to continue the fighting regardless of the cost to the realm to guarantee continued employment for his friends and clients as military officers. And the debate became so bitter that Essex penned a long defense of his position and circulated manuscript copies of it as a form of uh, scribal publication. There are many, many, many copies of this. Uh, by the way, many of them are a lot later. They're, so this, is, this becomes a famous document, much read, I think, probably in the 1620s and 30s, rather, not just in the immediate 1598, 1600, 1603 kind of period. Although glossed as a private letter to Anthony Bacon, uh, no one was fooled. This document clearly exposed the divisions at court for all the world to see. And at least some of Essex's fellow members of the Privy Council were really quite appalled and infuriated by this uh, action. Elizabeth's, sorry Elizabeth, Essex's um, often stormy relationship with Elizabeth also took a famously explosive turn during the same period. And you saw part of this in the, the, the grabs from the, the movies there. Uh, during a, an argument about military command in Ireland, uh, Essex behaved disrespectfully to the Queen, who boxed him on the ear. And Essex had to be pulled aside before his anger towards the Queen got him into some really serious trouble. This shocking incident was hushed up at the time, but there was no hiding the fact that Essex left the court and refused repeated summons to return. As the standoff dragged uh, on through July and August 1598, Lord Keeper Edgerton urged Essex to submit to the Queen, but Essex refused. Scribal copies of um, the letters between the two Privy Councillors subsequently began to circulate, presumably with the tacit approval of the two, uh, the two men. So again, this is one of many, many scribal copies of documents relating to Essex, the exchange with uh, Edgerton. Essex's part in this exchange would later come to be used against him by his enemies, especially the phrase, and you can see it right at that bottom line, cannot princes err. The larger context here is that the 1590s saw an increasing uh, official exaltation of the absoluteness of the monarchy, driven partly by battle over religious policy within the Church of England, but also clearly in response to Elizabeth's advancing age. Um, I, I put this here just to give you a sense of the, the kind of resort to fantasy to deal with the Queen's age. Right, this is a, obviously a famous portrait, the rainbow portrait. This uh, increased, increasing emphasis upon obsequiousness towards the Queen flattered Elizabeth's royal ego and suited her politically. But it also served uh, as a useful weapon against Essex in particular, whose words and act actions could be construed by his enemies as disrespectful to the queen herself and even portrayed as evidence of seditious intent. Despite this, Essex arguably won the three great political debates of 1598. So Elizabeth declined to make peace with Spain. Uh, he was eventually welcomed back to court in September. And when the bulk of the English army in Ireland was pretty much wiped out, the Battle of the Yellow Ford, um, 
Essex ultimately succeeded in winning command of the massive new army which England sent to Ireland to confront the full-scale insurgency there led by Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone. However, these wins came at a high political price and left him a, a hostage to fortune during the following year. Uh, Essex's expedition to Ireland in 1599 was the largest military force sent abroad from England since the days of Henry VIII. It's also, of course, one of the fabled political disasters of English history. I don't have time to go into the details about this here, but you know, a few general comments, I think, seem useful. Um, firstly, when he left. When he left, famously, there was this torrential downpour. Um, <clears throat> but his departure from London, despite this downpour of rain, attracted a huge crowd as one observer put, put it, as though the god of the earth had been new come amongst us. Essex's new army was also the largest military force in the British Isles at the time. And those two data points created a potentially dangerous combination. This was highlighted by the publication of John Hayward's book, the first part of the life and reign of King Henry IV, perhaps familiar to some of you, uh, which is really about the deposition of Richard II, uh, which was appeared in the weeks just before Essex headed off to Ireland. Not only did Hayward's fawning dedication to Essex revive memories of the Dolman book four years earlier, but it also directly connected Essex to Henry Bolingbroke, who in fact was an ancestor of the Earl. Essex's enemies could now suggest that 1599 might prove to be a new 1399, and that, that Hayward's book was, was a trial balloon for Essex's own designs upon the throne. In this view, Essex would do to Elizabeth what Bolingbroke had done to the similarly childless and heavy taxing Richard II. Hayward's book was soon banned, uh, and Hayward himself was eventually sent to the Tower, where he was um, repeatedly questioned about the book, but ultimately Cook could not prove anything he wanted to prove. So Hayward is in the Tower till the end of the reign. Now, um, Elizabeth surely knew that Essex did not harbour designs upon her throne. But she and Essex repeatedly clashed in letters over the choice of his subordinate officers for Ireland, over the cost of his campaign, and the lack of progress in confronting Hugh O'Neill in his Ulster heartland. Many of the, the Queen's complaints were unfair and reflected a complete lack of understanding of how war was waged. However, Essex's colleagues on the council, who certainly knew better, because some of them were themselves active soldiers, conspicuously failed to support his explanations. Even worse, his personal enemies at court, like Cobham, Rawley, and the Countess of Kildare, actively encouraged Elizabeth to view his actions in the worst possible light. Aggrieved, Essex wrote to complain that he was being stabbed in the back. Quote, I provided for this service a plastron and not a curate. That is, I am armed on the breast, but not on the back. Now, it's often said by uh, modern writers that Essex was paranoid. In fact, his enemies really were out to get him. Essex's alarm and sense of isolation in Ireland was compounded by news that his enemies at home were also seeking to undermine his ties with James VI of Scotland. Again, the, insinu the insinuation was that Essex would seek Elizabeth's throne for himself. Essex's close friend, Lord, Mount Lord Mountjoy, was compelled to send an agent to James to reassure him that Essex remained committed to his, that is, James's cause. Even so, this attempt to drive a wedge between Essex and James, I think, shows that the real goal of the, the political struggle during Elizabeth's last years was to win control over the succession before the Queen was to, before she would fall sick or, or died. By August 1599, Essex's army was exhausted. I won't go into why, but for various reasons. It was also um, especially demoralized by the Queen's demand that the Earl of Southampton surrender his command as Essex's general of the horse. 
Essex had to resort to large-scale dubbings of new knights to stop the gentleman volunteers in his army from following Southampton back to England and draining his fighting power even further. So there was a logic to this. It wasn't just political, there was a military logic to it. Erroneous intelligence about the imminent arrival of a new armada in England, the so-called Invisible Armada, also ended hopes of further reinforcement from there. Indeed, Elizabeth and the Privy Council were adamant that they had already sent Essex more than enough men and supplies in Ireland. Essex was so alarmed by this conjunction of events, and of course particularly the, the tone of his, his correspondence with the Queen and news about the way he's being done in by his enemies at court, that um, he privately talked with Southampton and with Sir Christopher Blunt, his, his uh, um, father-in-law, uh, about taking part of his army back to England to remove those whom he now regarded as traitors from around the Queen by force. Southampton and Blunt later claimed, this doesn't come up, it's not revealed until after the Rising, so in really March 1601, this is when this is, this is kind of aired, um, they later claimed to be completely horrified by the idea, and Essex, it seems, does let the idea drop. But I think we have to say that at least the germ of the idea of a civil war is now in the, in the, in the ether, as it were. So Essex obeys the Queen's command and marches north to confront the main um, force of the Irish on the Ulster border. He realises pretty quickly that he can't actually launch an assault on O'Neill's army, and so he falls back on the time-honoured practice in Ireland of agreeing a short-term truce. The result was Essex's infamous mid-river meeting with Hugh O'Neill at Ballaclinth Ford. So you can see this is one of the kind of romanticised later images of this famous event. Uh, unwisely, Essex agreed to O'Neill's suggestion that they should talk in private, in full view of their men, but out of earshot. This decision would later allow Essex's enemies to claim that he had conspired with O'Neill to advance his supposed plans for usurping the throne from Elizabeth. In fact, O'Neill wanted to convey his request for terms to the Queen in person. I mean, clearly, uh, O'Neill is, is cunning, and he knows he can, he can manipulate Essex here a bit, I think. Um, and he wants to make sure he doesn't put anything down on paper himself that might come back to bite him. Because it, it, you know, if he did that, he, could, he might lose support among his own uh, Irish uh, allies. But if he does it verbally, he can either go with it or he can then deny it. So those requests to Essex included um, demands for liberty of conscience, the return of Irish lands, guarantee for his own position in Ulster, and a single comprehensive agreement which would make O'Neill himself the national negotiator for all of the Irish. <coughs> By this point, Essex was desperate to return to, to, to Elizabeth. Uh, he knows that the, the, the clock is ticking on the, the truce, and above all, he's afraid that news of his deal with uh, Tyrone will leak and be used against him by his enemies. So he left his army uh, to others and rushed back to England with a small bodyguard of trusted companions. Um, their job, by the way, was to rescue him if he was going to be sent to the Tower of London. Um, and as we saw in, the, in, I think, a couple of the clips, he, he arrives at Nunsuch Palace unexpected. The Queen's not fully dressed. Um, he, they have another meeting when he's cleaned up from his journey because he'd fallen off his horse and was all mired with mud and stuff. Um, that seemed to go quite well. But um, later in the day, things turned frosty. The pro and anti Essex, pro and anti -Essex factions pointedly sat apart uh, for dinner at lunchtime. We'd call it lunchtime, they call it dinner at court. And in the afternoon, um, Essex was ordered to appear before the council and late that, that night, he is uh, given a, a command from the Queen to confine himself to his chamber. And that signaled that Essex's gamble had failed. Instead of offering a way to end the war in Ireland and pulling the teeth uh, of his domestic enemies, Essex was now to be investigated for dereliction of duty, disrespect for the Queen's authority, and anything else his enemies could dredge up against him. He was also placed in the custody of Lord Keeper Edgerton at 
uh, York House, which meant that the, the officers who'd come back with him don't know what to do. Do we break him out? He's is Edgerton friendly, don't know what to do, so they do nothing. This confusion of Essex's companions epitomises the broader question which arose after the Earl's unexpected return from Ireland at the end of September 1599. What do you do with a problem like Essex? Essex was soon cleared of any immediate charges relating to his time in Ireland, but Elizabeth could not forgive him for returning without her prior approval and for failing to defeat Tyrone. Uh, Essex's arrest soon prompted Tyrone to abandon his peacemaking and to double down with his, on his alliance with Spain instead. And Essex's enemies regarded this, and snippets of favorable comment about Essex, which they picked up from informers, um, as um, it further evidence of a conspiracy between the two earls. And they then want to use this to try and construct a treason case against Essex. They even doctored the evidence by selectively quoting documents in ways which completely changed the meaning. Ultimately, though, Essex remained in a kind of political purgatory. He's unindicted. Um, he's finally allowed to return to Essex House uh, in the spring of 1600, but he's also a kind of political unperson. No one quite knows what to make of him, what to do. Will he be punished? Will he not be punished? This anomalous status was emphasized by the curious sort of quasi-legal quasi proceedings which convened at York House on the 5th of June, 1600. Over the course of 11 hours, Essex effectively cleared himself of the allegations made against him, but he nevertheless was suspended from his offices and returned to house arrest. Now, during Essex's long months of detention, his friends and leading servants increasingly divided into two camps. One group emphasized Essex's need to placate the queen and argued that the path to his full rehabilitation lay in showing himself as suitably chastised and eager to regain the queen's favor in whatever manner she desired. The other group chafed at such ideas and instead plotted to recover the Earl's former glory by rallying military support from Lord Mountjoy, who had replaced Essex in Ireland as commander there, and even from James in Scotland. While the former group seems to have been led by Lord Henry Howard, the latter group included Essex's sister, Lady Rich, his steward, Sir Gilly Merrick, and two of his secretaries, Henry Cuff and William Temple, as well as the Earl of Southampton and Southampton's friend, Sir Charles Danvers. Now that story may um, strike you as familiar um, from Camden, from Camden's annals, um, because the Camden does talk about this. We now know that, that Camden got that from directly from Lord Henry Howard. So he used Howard's materials. And you can see this is part of Howard's long narrative about this. Essex himself seems to have been caught between these two groups and committed himself sort of halfway uh, to both agendas. And the breaking point uh, came at Michaelmas 1600 when the Queen refused to renew his, his all important uh, grant of uh, customs on the sweet wines. This decision shattered Essex's finances, which had been repeatedly stretched to breaking point over the past decade to make up for shortfalls in Elizabeth's military spending. Yes, that's where he's spending a lot of his money, paying for soldiers. Now Essex embraced the hardliners and began to plot revenge against his enemies, whom he blamed for poisoning the queen against him. However, he did so by framing his action as a public good and not merely a private act. Essex believed that his enemies had effectively made Elizabeth a captive queen and that she needed to be freed from their influence. Given his long-term alliance with James VI of Scotland, Essex also feared that his enemies must necessarily be aligning themselves with rival candidates for the throne, especially the Infanta of Spain. Essex also, therefore, had to act to safeguard Elizabeth's true successor and the future of Protestant religion in England. Ironically, many of those close to Essex and involved in his scheming were actually Catholic, although a number of them concealed that fact at the time. These Catholics shared Essex's hostility to Spain, but saw Essex, and through him James, 
as the key to ending the increasingly brutal persecution which was being directed at Catholics under the aegis of Sir Robert Cecil. For his part, James's political calculations were dramatically reset by the Gowrie plot of early August 1600. This incident resulted in the death of the Earl of Gowrie and his brother amid claims by James that they'd tried to assassinate him. I think it's more likely that they bungled an attempt to kidnap him, which of course kidnapping the king is a, again a time-honored move in Scotland. Um, doesn't go down well so well in England. Um, James suspected, uh, crucially though, James suspects Robert Cecil's behind this. In other words, it's come from England. And that made him very receptive when Essex penned an urgent appeal for help on Christmas Day 1600. To underline the point about the common threat which they face from a prospective Spanish succession, the code for James's agreement to support Essex consisted of a book order for three volumes conspicuously used as source material in the Dolman book. Sir Robert Cecil didn't learn about this letter, um, from a secret letter from Essex to James until later, but he did receive warnings from multiple sources that James now regarded him as an enemy. Cecil blamed uh, Essex's contacts in Scotland for poisoning the king against him. Can you see the mirror effect going on here? Um, Cecil was careful to mask his own feelings and to work through others, as usual, but it's striking that Sir Walter Raleigh felt uh, Cecil would be receptive to the argument that Essex must die if Cecil, and by extension Raleigh, uh, was to remain politically and personally secure. Um, Cecil himself advanced um, the same kind of zero-sum logic when he and Lord Buckhurst secretly reached out to the, the Jesuit leader Robert Parsons in Rome in 1600. Although Cecil and Parsons were enemies, Cecil's reasons for this overture to, to, uh, to, to Rome and to Madrid through him um, seemed compelling to Parsons. These reasons included, quote, they cannot postpone much longer coming to terms with the King of Scotland because they are afraid of the Queen dying and that uh, what thereafter may be the aims of their enemy, the Earl of Essex. Cecil Buckhurst and their allies claim to be especially alarmed by James's ruthlessness after the Gowrie plot, quote, since they are afraid the same procedure might easily be followed in England should he and his Scottish friends come to govern in the realm. Now Cecil's overture to Parsons was almost certainly insincere, uh, even if the political problem he outlined was accurate. Of course, Raleigh and Cecil both understood there was a much simpler solution to the problem um, which Cecil's agent had outlined to Parsons than flirting with the Infanta. To break the nexus between Essex and James, they only needed to convince Elizabeth to proceed with the treason charges against Essex, which Attorney General Cook had been trying to pin on him since 1599. However, Cook's charges refused to stick. That's because they're confected nonsense. Uh, and Elizabeth still stubbornly refused to turn against her former favourite. Cecil and Raleigh therefore needed to do something which would force the Queen to change her mind once and for all. In and around Essex House, the Earl and his friends faced a mirror image of the same problem. How could they get to the Queen con and convince her that Cecil, Raleigh, Cobham and the others had been lying to her about Essex and that those enemies of the Earl were the real traitors? who were <clears throat> supposedly selling out the succession to Spain and appropriating her royal authority for their own pecuniary benefit. Moreover, this had to be a public act for the public good in contrast to the private corruption of their enemies. Essex's solution, what we might, we might call plan A, was to invite James to send an ambassador, the Earl of Mar, uh, to present Elizabeth with charges against Essex's enemies. Essex would secretly include his own charges amongst those presented by Ma in the king's name. Um, Elizabeth would then be forced to listen to a fellow sovereign and it was hoped uh, would find it difficult to take no action in response. And that was Essex's plan through to mid-late January 1601, when it became clear that Ma's embassy was taking too long to assemble. <clears throat> 
More importantly, it seemed uh, increasingly apparent that the Earl's enemies were willing to use violence against him, even in defiance of the Queen's own commands. The inciting action here, one that may be familiar to you, was Lord Grey's unprovoked attack on the Earl of Southampton on the Strand on the 9th of January. Southampton was saved by the intervention of apprentice boys, but the incident and the lim limited consequences for Grey convinced Essex's friends and followers that not even the Queen herself could protect them from their enemies. As a result, veteran officers were hastily summoned to London to serve as bodyguards and planning began for a direct approach to the Queen at Whitehall. So we might call this Essex's plan B. This was the business which was discussed at Drury House at the start of February, when plans were drawn up to clear the way for Essex and a dozen other lords to enter the royal presence and give the Queen uh, a petition for redress against the Earl's enemies. Ultimately, Essex never finalized these plans nor was there a firm date set for entry into the palace, a frank, it, it, contrary to what I assumed uh, um, when I read John Keevil's book, uh, Hamie the Stranger. Um, in fact, a careful look at the, the crucial letter from Dr. Hamie, and you can see this is the, the original here, um, shows that some of the information he relayed to Professor Hernius about the Essex Rising is distinctly dubious. Uh, I'm also, by the way, um, now uncertain about the extent to which those friends of Essex who paid for Shakespeare and his fellow players to perform the old play of Richard II at the Globe Theatre on the afternoon of 7th, the 7th of February actually knew about Essex's plans. The three men who seemed to have organised that performance, Sir Charles and Sir Jocelyn Percy, Percy and uh, Lord Mount Eagle, surely knew that something was being planned and that things seem to be coming to a head, but it's impossible to know if they were actually in the loop because they were never questioned about this. They were also apparently not questioned about the play itself, which seemed to have been of little interest to the authorities after the rising, even though uh, Augustine Phillips was called in to give a token de deposition on behalf of all the players uh, on the day before the trial of Essex and Southampton. Some of you may have seen that before. In fact, Shakespeare's play was really only used to thicken up the subsequent charges against Essex's steward, Sir Gilly Merrick, even though Merrick seems to have had no obvious connection with the play. Indeed, Phillips's testimony was explicitly cited as trial evidence against Merrick, even though Phillips doesn't mention Merrick. By the time of his trial, Merrick knew he was a dead man and um, basically made no real effort to defend himself. By contrast, the Percy brothers and Mount Eagle were retained only briefly and then fined only for their participation in the events of Sunday the 8th of February. What is certain about the play staged on the 7th of February is it had no direct connection with the events of the following day. The Essex Rising of the 8th of February might be called Essex's Plan C of 1601 and was the product of events which unfolded only in the late afternoon and early evening of the 7th of February, after the play was finished. For reasons that remain unclear, Essex was suddenly appear, summoned to appear before the Privy Council at Salisbury Court, that's Buckhurst's house. Dr. Hamey suggests that, that incriminating papers had been found in the trousers of one of Essex's servants, but unfortunately that, that's a very interesting idea, very colorful, but there's no supporting evidence for that. I think it's more likely that Cecil heard something useful from one of his spies inside Essex House. He had two or three of those and convinced the Queen that Essex had some explaining to do. Well, Essex twice refused to leave Essex House and go to Salisbury Court. Essex received supposedly trustworthy intelligence from court that he'd be murdered if, by Raleigh and Cobham if he left his house to go to the council. We know from Rawley's admission on the eve of his own execution in 1618 that, quote, my Lord of Essex was fetched off by a trick. By the way, that, that document, that letter's been in print since the 18th century. It's kind of remarkable to me that people don't, haven't thought about what it means for the Essex Rising um, until fairly recently. I would suggest this trick was probably the false story of the assassination plot by Rawley and Cobham. <laughs> 
I'd further speculate that it was concocted by Rawley and Cecil, and that its purpose was to panic Essex into doing something rash by raising the specter of imminent violence and inducing him to refuse a direct command from the Queen. A second fake message subsequently warned Essex that Rawley and Cobham would use the Royal Guard to mount an overnight attack on Essex House itself. So Cecil had spies in Essex House, he had curtailed Essex's access to friends at court, and he knew exactly how to manipulate the Earl into putting himself beyond the pale with the Queen. Essex convened an emergency meeting of his friends and considered his options. One was to flee to safety far away, either in Wales or abroad, but as in 1600, he refused to live as an exile. Another option was to gather his friends and head straight to the court to see the Queen. Sir Ferdinand de Gorges killed this idea by falsely claiming that the court was already on armed alert against him. That was a lie. This left one option, to seek protection from the Lord Mayor and Aldermen of London, who could shield Essex from his enemies and act as an intermediary between him and the Queen. And that was the original kernel of what we know as the Essex Rising. And ironically, one of the basic aims of this plan was to prevent the Earl's enemies from being able to cast his efforts to protect himself as a rebellion against the Queen. So <laughs> he's done for the very thing he tried not to do. So time's running short, but the brief version is anything that could go wrong the next morning did go wrong. Uh, messengers failed to deliver their messages. The plan to meet with the, the Lord Mayor and Alderman as they left Sunday service at St Paul's uh, became hopelessly fouled up when the Queen sent a delegation of four lords to demand an end to the armed defence of Essex House and the dispersal of the crowd of uh, Essex's supporters there who had rallied to protect him. Essex eventually detained the lords under armed guard, and I think the reason he did, does that is because he's trying to protect them from angry Catholics, in particular Edgerton and uh, Popham, both of whom are hated by Catholics. Popham, with very good reason. And he then headed into the city on foot. Uh, Essex's action was subsequently prosecuted as imprisonment of the Queen's envoys. Things went from bad to worse in the city, especially after Cecil drafted a proclamation of rebellion against Essex and his companions. Uh, Essex, incidentally, uh, claimed this had been drafted and proclaimed without the Queen's knowledge. It's just faintly possible he's right. However, minor violence fled in Gracious Street and then again more seriously at Ludgate. Any hope of Essex justifying his actions as purely self-protective now crumbled. Essex barely escaped back to Essex House but had to surrender there after a short uh, siege by forces mustered in the Queen's name. Although es Essex himself may have been willing to seek political martyrdom, most of his followers were less keen to fight on when heavy cannon were ready to bombard the house at point blank range. Well, arguably, whoops, gone too far, sorry. Um, arguably, um, the Essex Rising was Sir Robert Cecil's finest hour. With minimal bloodshed, Cecil was able to manipulate his enemy into a whole series of fatal missteps, which not only resulted in Essex's execution, but which also enabled him to dictate the official narrative of his rival's fall as one of treason, rebellion, and an imaginary conspiracy with Tyrone and the Pope. Former Essexians now desperately petitioned Cecil for help. Cecil's allies, like Rawley and Popham, were able to shamelessly milk wealthy Essexians for the purchase of a pardon. Essex's elimination also opened the way for Cecil to forge a new alliance with James, who was grateful that his own dealings with Essex were carefully suppressed to prevent them compromising his right to be Elizabeth's successor, because if they'd come to, if they'd been made public, he would have been debarred. As a result, just as the Dolman book had predicted, the surgical application of trickery, a little violence, and the deployment of the machinery of state effectively sorted out the question of the succession without the need for a full-scale civil war. So I'm going to stop at this point. I have a f in my abstract, there's a few things I talk about, so the, sort of the consequences of this and how they affect the opening of James's reign, but perhaps I'll just leave that for Q&A. I'm just conscious I don't want to run into Claire's time, so I'll stop at that point. Thank you.